Hi, I'm Kirby Allison, and today I'm back in one of my favorite places in all of London, if not all the world, uh, and that is Davidoff of London with my two good friends, Edward and Eddie Sahakian. Gentlemen, thank you so much. If you have seen my voice lying around anywhere, uh, please let me know. <laughs> <laughs> Kirby, what a pleasure to welcome you again. Yeah. Your voice uh, is everywhere. I hope you don't find it because we don't want you to leave. <laughs> no. Well, it's, it's somewhere out there on the interwebs. It's a it's pleasure a... to have you here, yeah. Kirby. Sorry about your voice, but I think it's quite sexy. Don't yeah. you worry about it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. You're too kind, too kind. Um, <clears throat> well, of course, you know, one of the things I love most about London isn't just the access to some of the best cigars in the world, uh, but really a great company in which to smoke those cigars. So in the tradition of this channel, I was hoping that we could enjoy some of each other's company uh, over a cigar. It looks like you may have a few other things planned for us. Uh, oh, and just yes. talk about all the things that we love so much. Uh, Cuba, cigars, and just one another. May, may I apologize that I have started smoking my <laughs> cigar already without waiting for you. However, I couldn't resist the temptation in enjoying this cigar. Well, we were very rude in making you wait too long. But uh, I do know that Eddie's got a few things prepared. I shall leave it to Eddie. Well, uh, with pleasure, Kirby. Uh, allow me to, to, to go and seek um, maybe a little preamble. It's <laughs> difficult to find a cigar that you probably haven't smoked yet or that we haven't enjoyed together yet that we think worthy of enjoying together. <laughs> You're too kind. However, uh, a dear friend, uh, a gentleman by the name of Gabe, had the idea and he's right. There is one in our humidor from Dad's Keep that has been um, maturing since 1996, mm. but maturing very slowly, okay. and I'll explain why in a moment. May I seek that? Yeah, please. I'm, uh, I mean, one of the things <clears throat> that we've had the distinct pleasure of enjoying on this trip was the Edwards Hockey and Lounge at the Bulgari Hotel. Uh, Eddie was very nice to invite us over and welcomed us in. We were able to film for the channel, of course, and uh, one of the things I was particularly struck by was your generosity in even allowing cigars from your private reserve out of your personal humidor and into a place like the Bulgari uh, Hotel, the Sa Edward Sahakian Lounge, uh, for people to enjoy. And so I can only imagine what you're holding back here. Well, to be honest, uh, Eddie's in charge of looking after the Bulgari Lounge. And if he asks for anything, he knows I will not say no. Almost anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do we have? Well, this is a Bolivar. Uh, and Bolivar, as you know, is one of the richer, stronger, if not strongest blends Cuba do. Uh, this box has some unique qualities to it. Firstly, it's the Churchill, which is a uh, appropriate celebratory size mm. for your visit, Kirby. Uh, second of all, it's from 1996, and that's the box date. As you probably know, the rather eccentric uh, espionage that goes behind <laughs> the early years of the Cuban factory and box coding. Because they weren't straightforward. It was, no. now they have a proper year and month on them. Yes, yeah. they still disguise the factory code, okay. but we know from this code that this box of Bolivars was actually rolled in the Partagas factory. Mm -hmm. This would have been the old Partagas factory. And N-O, so that takes us to October, and S-A takes us to 1996. Wow. So this tobacco is from 95, which is the year that Cuba switched their plant production. They changed the species as a consequence of some mold issues they had. So there's a chance that tobacco we're smoking here is the truly old Cuban variety really? that is no longer grown. Huh. We shall find out. <laughs> The and other, Bolivar, I mean, I have to say, is amongst my most favorite of all the brands. So, uh, I'm really you, you know happy. me well. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm so happy to hear that, Kirby. And, and I promise you, with your voice the way it is right now, you cannot blame the Bolivar because this is a very smooth example mm. with this sort of age. Um, the fact they're in tubes is a really interesting, more recent discovery, uh, certainly for me and, and I think for my father. Uh, you will. Remember, we've been aging cigars here really since 1980. And uh, we have a few humidity and temperature considerations we impose different to the norm. Mm -hmm. One is a colder temperature and one is a slightly lower humidity. What neither one of us, I think, 
appreciated at the time was that a cigar in a tube will get even slower at reaching its perfection. Really? Oh, wow. It's a little time capsule. Now that we think on reflection, it's obvious. The oxygen is diminished. The amount of transference that can happen is reduced. Time we never thought of it. And in the early days, people would consider the cigars in tubes as the cigars that were too ugly to be put for undressed or dressed mm. boxes. I don't believe that's true because when you see these, you will, you will appreciate what beauties have gone in. Wow. Here we have it. And just have a sniff of that cigar. What an honor. <laughs> You're allowing him to do this. <laughs> Absolutely. No, thank you, Edward. I cannot think of anybody better than you smoking the first oh, one out of the box. The this is amazing. What do you think of the bouquet? I mean, for me, it's... Take a, take a whiff of the just open tube. Very fresh. No? Yes. There's youth there. I mean, we can't quite call it youth, but this would be an extremely well-preserved 40-year-old. That's... Yes. You know, you see someone <laughs> occasionally, you think, wow. They cannot be their it's age. It's the Dorian Gray of cigars. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Dad. This is amazing. So this is a, a Churchill. It is. It's an exact Churchill. So um, it's a Julieta number two, I believe, is the, is the factory name. Um, we call it a 747 because it's seven inches by 47 mm -hmm. ring gauge. Um, it's typically an hour and a quarter, hour and a half perhaps to enjoy. If it was youth, a youthful Bolivar, it would certainly knock you back and your voice may suffer for a few more days. <laughs> but with this much age, uh, the nicotine has diminished significantly. The wondrous third fermentation that can sometimes happen in, in really old cigars will certainly have taken place here. Mm. And if we're lucky, we're going to have something uh, sublime. Really? Wow. So how is this different? I mean, one of my other favorite cigars you can't find anymore uh, is the uh, Corona Gigantes from Bolivar. Yes. How would that compare to this? Well, that is exactly the same cigar. Okay. The difference being, one has been kept in tubes, whereas the Corona Gigantes is never tubed. Okay. It will always be in an in undressed box. Exactly right. Otherwise identical. Um, what will also change and differ over time is where they're produced. Okay. This one we know very definitively is made in the Partagas factory because of the box code. Not all Bolivars will be made in the Partagas factory. And Partagas factory, certainly the old one, uh, is for me up there with the Eleguito factory mm -hmm. as a center of excellence in, in production in Cuba. It's a beautiful cigar. Well, I, I hope it lives up to expectation. May I just, I'm just feeling them. As you, as you know, I like to tickle the cigars to make sure they're gonna draw well. And I think this one though firm will draw well. If it doesn't, I will take responsibility and my father will pull out another one and he'll pick it next time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's fine. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, beautiful. You know, we had uh, the pleasure today. I mean, this is a um, kind of a grand slam of uh, days uh, in that before this, we were at Hunters and Francao visiting with Jimma Freeman. And one of the things that she pulled out and, and showed us was a cabinet of 50 Corona Gigantes. I think from the late 90s. And I was trying to twist her arm to make sure that it was allocated here. So I might be able to <laughs> then twist your arm into buying that. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> their reserve collection is amazing. They have yes. some of the finest cigars. And your there. reserve collection, I mean, is, is really second to none. May I prepare uh, it for you? Please. One other little point I should mention, because of course, talking about German and Hunters and Frankau, uh, a very, another distinguishing feature on this box is this very early EMS badge. Mm. Now, as you know, EMS uh, was created by, by Gemma's father and uh, Mr. Nick Freeman, and it denotes English market selection. And this is a stamp that's put on all cigars imported by Hunters and Frankau from, I believe, 1994. Really? So okay. this would have been potentially the second, maybe third year of issuance. And for the first few years, they kept the same badge, this green, um, it looks like a currency almost. It's only in 99, I believe, that they began to change the colors each year. So again, this is a bit of history for, for mm. stamp collectors out there. Um, it's beautiful. This is an amazing box. And so this was sitting downstairs. 
This was sitting downstairs, um, as my father likes to say, not lost. <laughs> but under, under lock and key. <laughs> under lock and key. <laughs> but recently discovered. Yeah. Uh, I mean, how is it, so whenever you look at your reserve collection, I mean, how is it that you decide what it is that you're going to release or what it is you're gonna pull up into the shop? I mean, it must just be absolutely impossible. I mean, if I have trouble smoking my cigars from my humidor, you know, that are relatively uh, uninteresting compared to what you guys have the privilege of, of smoking, I can't imagine how you gentlemen do it. Thank you, Edward. Well, if it was up to me, I would have not released any of them. <laughs> but so your question a has true, to be directed a to true Eddie. Addition, <laughs> a true connoisseur. It, it's, um, I, I, I suppose it's the same method, perhaps, that a wine collector mm. would bring to bear on which bottle they're going to enjoy that day. Um, it, it, it depends on mood, depends on how we feel, it depends on how business is doing, <laughs> yeah. um, and it depends on the scarcity. Um, and sometimes blind luck, you know, I, I'm walking through the cigar room downstairs and stumble upon a box, catches my eye, I think, oh, it's been a long time, we haven't smoked one of these. So how did it come? So they, they speak to you, they call out. They call out. <laughs> that's where he comes running to me, oh dad, look what I found. <laughs> and that's where I tell him, it was never lost, I've kept it there now. <laughs> You're going to enjoy one with us, of course. I am. I'm, uh, Dad, may, may I? Actually, no. Shall I, I prepare one for you as well, Eddie? Give me the pleasure. Well, that, that would be spoiling me too much, but go on then. Why not, Dad? And whilst I'm doing this, you could perhaps spoil I, us with a glass with of... something special to drink. Thank you. Yes. That's, well, mm. this is so delicate. I mean, it really has a yes. softness to it. it. It will. And, and with all good vintage cigars, a little bit of patience is, is necessary for the first couple of inches, two or three inches. Um, and then if it's going to be magnificent, it will begin to talk to you. So why is that? So talk me through that. If, well, not, I've smoked very few and if I, I, cigars of this age, and if I did, it was certainly in your company uh, uh, and uh, by virtue of your generosity. So someone that has, of course, smoked more of these than I have. Uh, talk, talk about that a little bit. Well. There is the ongoing process of what we call micro-fermentation that, that takes place with a cigar once it's been boxed. And typically that requires the right humidity, the right temperature, and contact between tobacco. In these cases, that process will continue. And with a tube, it will be slowed down, but not entirely. There comes a point where that process reaches its natural end. So for example, in the wine world, there'll come a wine which has gone past its best. Mm -hmm. And the same can happen with cigars. The point at which that best is, is subjective. And for some people who desire and enjoy a much spicier, more youthful flavor profile, that point happens around year 10 or 15 of a cigar's life. For other people, and Certainly, my own palate has, has learned to appreciate it as time's gone on, as with my father's, I think, from the very beginning. Um, we hunt for the more delicate flavors. And whilst we enjoy a youthful cigar, a cigar with age and maturity has plenty to say in a more subtle way. And that can happen for many, many years beyond. Hmm. It can be 20 years, it can be 30 years. We've smoked cigars at 40, 45 really? years that yeah. still have something to say. Yeah. Um, and that's a subjective experience. Yeah. How does the texture of the smoke change over time? That's a very good question. The you mean mouth the, the mouthfeel? Yeah. Mm. What do you think, Dad? I don't know. Once I start smoking and enjoying the cigar, I just enjoy it. It could vary from cigar to cigar. Yeah. It will vary according what I had to eat or drink before or during. <laughs> If you have a zip of this lovely champagne, which Eddie is going to hopefully offer to us, you will see that the first puff, the second puff, and the puff after drinking a sip of the champagne, it will vary. You'll probably notice I'm using uh, cognac glasses, but I've discovered this particular champagne 
tastes even better. I don't know why in a Louis XIII crystal glass. Just to digress, what we are enjoying is a Paul Roger Sir Winston from 2012. Wow. And um, I do believe it's a candidate for best of the century so far. <laughs> we won't know for sure. There's plenty more testing to be done. Yes. Thank you, Eddie. Very and you can you. see Sir Winston there. He's uh, got yes. a smile on his face. Uh, <laughs> we're doing him we're proud. Smoking his favorite cigar, drinking his favorite champagne. We, we, we don't, or at least I don't often pair champagne with cigars because being very effervescent, I find that a champagne can, can interfere with the same area of the palate that a cigar occupies mm -hmm. uh, and can sometimes cause disturbance. But when you have such a fine champagne with so much body uh, and so much to say, I think they're a match made in heaven. Okay. Who might argue with so instant? I certainly won't argue with, uh, with you. Uh, My dear cheers, Kirby, to your very good health. <laughs> to your good health, uh, to you, to your family. You. And thank you for making this long journey <laughs> to be here once again. It's a true pleasure to welcome you here. We're so delighted to have you here. Gentlemen. To your good health. Uh, thank you. Likewise. Good health. Mm. Yeah, delicious. Mm. Now the next puff you take on the cigar, it'll taste different. Dad, I didn't have an opportunity to thank you for lighting my cigar. It is a pleasure, Eddie. I will do that anytime you want to. Uh, <laughs> I will too. even smoke it for you if you wish. <laughs> um, it reminds me, this reminds me of one of the great cigars we smoked together, although virtually, during lockdown, uh, was a, a 1990s Davidoff number no. one Cuban. And this reminds me much of that in that it's got those more subtle, yes. almost yeasty flavors, kind of that you would never find in a, a young cigar. And Absolutely. much in the same way that vintage champagne is completely incomparable you know, to a newer bottle. That's an excellent comparison, by the way. I'm sorry to jump in there, because often I use that comparison between vintage champagne and a young champagne to explain how different the flavor profiles can be in a, in a cigar. Um, I don't know if you agree, Dad. That's Absolutely. No, definitely. Mm. That's interesting. So whenever it comes to aging, of course, of, of which you guys are experts in, do you have any other tubos that you've kind of gravitated towards aging that you find are aging particularly well? I think we should have some of the Romeo and Juliet Churchills. Yes, uh, yes, a perennial classic. Uh, well, at least I had them, I don't yeah. know, recently. <laughs> uh, short answer is yes, uh, Romeo Churchills, of course. We have some punch Churchill tubes. Uh, some very modest and humble cigars, you know, Romeo and Giulietta number threes. Uh, I had some Monte Cristo Petit Tubos and Tubos from the mid 2000s. Um, I've had some Upman and Hoya de Monterey uh, tubes from 80s, the 1980s. Mm. They have retained remarkable personality. Interesting. And it's a small cigar. Yeah. Um, the one I'm most pleased about is some Davidoff number twos which I discovered uh, because they did them in tubes. And um, this is the Cuban production. And in the tubes, they have aged so much, so much, so much slower than the regular number twos. Mm. So it gives me courage that I can continue to smoke them and enjoy them, hopefully with my son. Yeah. Uh, and perhaps daughter as well. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Well, as Gemma is a great example of, yes. you know, even even uh, lovely ladies are enjoying fine cigars these days. Oh, yes. Absolutely. We're getting more and more lady smokers joining the wonderful world of enjoying a cigar. Mm. So what do you think of uh, cabinets versus the turbos uh, versus boxes of 25 and 10? Um, you know, if one is looking to 
invest in something to age? You know, do you, I mean, how do you think about those and categorize them? For me, the larger the box of the cigar, the more I will prefer that. In the old days, long before I had this shop, in the 70s, I used to buy my cigars from the Dunhill shop here in German Street. And they had a cigar called Don Candido's. Okay. Don Candido number 500. And they came in boxes of 100. Mm. Beautiful cigar. Someone needs to bring that back. <laughs> well, I keep on <laughs> saying that. Think. Can you imagine? And sadly, that disappeared. Box but of 100. 100 boxes. And what type yes. of cigar? What type of format? It was a Churchill size. Oh, wow. Don Candido, specially made f for Dunhill. And uh, I still have, I think, one or two of the. I have one empty box for sure, and I did have a half empty box or half full box, depending on how you look at it, <laughs> once upon a time. I'm not sure if it's still there. <laughs> I didn't touch it. <laughs> But to me, uh, these days, if you're lucky, if you're lucky enough to get a bundle of 50, that is my preference, Quite rare. definitely. Very rare. Yeah. Uh, but the bundles of 50, there's something magical about it. And it's no secret, I've said this many times, my desert island cigar would be a box of a, a Hoya de Monterey double Corona in a bundle of 50, preferably without the bands, which will show its age. Really? And so when... When does that delineate the band being introduced onto the cigar? Uh, they introduced the bands on the cigars in the last seven, eight, ten years. It's longer. It's, it's, yeah. I think it was mid-2000s, maybe mid to late 2000s. Because the cabinets of 50 were traditionally unbanded. Correct? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. They all came unbanded. But would a box of 25 of the same cigar been unbanded? No. No. Okay, so it was well, distinctive. Well, uh, no, the, yes. Uh, at one Epicers did. The Epicur 1s and 2s yes. did. That they came in smaller bundles of 25. Mm. But the double coronas, the Hoyas, they all came in flat boxes of 25 or huh. sliding top 50 bundles yeah. of 50. But Dad, admit why that would be your Desert Island. Cigar. Oh, I forgot to say also the David of number two in boxes of 50 as well. Hmm. Not in bundles, but in flat boxes. Really? There was 50 in that. And a very rare production, which I did have. I don't know what's happened to it. The Cohiba. Why does he look at you? Yeah, when he no, says it? The <laughs> Cohiba, the Cohiba Corona Special, Eddie. Do you and remember Lanceros boxes as of well. the boxes of fifty and the Lanceros? I do remember them. Uh, some, some. He built his house with those. <laughs> Listen, back door. school fees are expensive in London. <laughs> yeah. If we could stop the session, I just have to run down, and <laughs> <laughs> check, and come back. <laughs> They're oh. very safe where you left them, Dad. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, I must say, I'm, 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 I guess I'm a little pleased to hear that because I was able to come across two recent, I'd say, massive wins. One was a cabinet of 50 of the Hoya de Monterey double Coronas to complement the oh. Cabinet of 50 Lusitanias that I purchased here. Oh. And, and it's, I've, I've come to appreciate this more uh, in the recent weeks, a box of Trinidad Fundadores yes, that of my mother-in-law oh, picked up from that me in Mexico well. City. Yep. That's priceless, very difficult to find. And, and a wonderful cigar. Makes me feel better for how much I paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> However much you paid it, it'll be worth Whatever more Whatever you tomorrow. pay for it is worth twice the price today after the recent price increases Cuba introduced. Mm -hmm. So you're we very lucky to that. Yes, yes. Come on, Eddie, he knows the mm. whole story. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Kirby Allison, and today's video was brought to you by KirbyAllison.com, where you'll find the largest collection of luxury garment care and luxury shoe care accessories in the world, as well as other great clothing accessories for the well-dressed, like this sovereign grade necktie, pocket squares, braces, socks, and so much more. So if you enjoy the content that we film on this channel, make sure you visit KirbyAllison.com. Well, no, it's, you it, leave the delicate subjects yeah. for him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he still wants to visit Cuba, that's why. <laughs> no, I, I, I jest with that. It was a surprise for, for most of us in the industry. Uh, probably not um, 
not unexpected. However, uh, the timing was very sudden and the move or the change was very dramatic. Mm. Essentially, the um, Habanos, who are the marketing distribution arm of, of the Cuban state when it comes to c cigars, announced that they would uh, be increasing or sorry, equalizing the price of all Cohiba, all Trinidad, the Monte Cristo 1935 series, the Roman Giulietta Linea de Oro series, and a few in Partagas and a few more in the Monte Cristo lines. And the express purpose is to equalize them to the same retail price as Hong Kong, which is amongst, if not the most expensive retail market for cigars even in the world. Even more than London. Even more than London. To mm. so equalize, it means the same price all over the world. Interesting. Yes. And that's, I guess, controlled through the distributors. <clears throat> well, yes. Um, because the price of a cigar in any country is largely a function of the import duties and taxes. Absolutely. I don't know how they're going to do that, but I'm sure they worked out the system, which how it will apply considering the duties, the taxes and everything else. But you will be, from now on, you will be paying the same price for a box of Trinidad Fundadores. Whatever you pay for it here, it will be equivalent that you would purchase in Hong Kong or in Mexico or in Spain or in France or in Switzerland, wherever you buy that cigar, it will be exactly the same price. Yeah. Any speculation as to why? Were the well, price differences that dramatic? Well, th th there are some good reasons. I think some, uh, you know, the, the, the first gut reaction is it's greed, but it's not. It's much more complex than that. Um, Cuba, for, for several years now, has been unable to produce enough, uh, certainly in those brands, to satisfy global demand. Um, very, very noticeably, it has not made the same mistake it made in the 90s, which was to ramp up production to meet demand mm -hmm. and compromise on quality. This yeah. time round, they have kept quality at a consistently high level. Which, um, which I have to say, it's really been quite quite impressive. Yes. Place. Oh, yes. I mean, you can imagine the temptation to yeah. just release the floodgates and, <coughs> you know, give them more of what they mm -hmm. want. But they haven't done that. And therefore, justifiably, they feel they have a truly luxury product, handmade, which it is. And therefore, its price should be done in the same manner as any of the other luxury products out there, whether it's a Patek Philippe watch, mm -hmm. an Hermes handbag, a Gevrey Chambertin wine, um, you do not get the type of differences in price internationally in those products as you do, as you do cigars. in cigars. Yeah. Um, so if they take that extra money and revenue they will obtain and reinvest it in the industry, which it deserves and needs, then it can only be a win-win in the long term for everyone, whilst in the short term it's a painful hit for the consumer. Yeah. No one wants to pay that much more for a cigar. How much more are the prices increasing, say, in London? About 50, 60 percent oh, wow. on, on Cohibas and Trinidads, wow. um, less on the other increase. lines. But it's, it's a meaningful change. And, um, and I think Cohiba and Trinidad will probably sustain, or some of the sizes in those will, will sustain that price increase. Uh, but there are some strange anomalies. So, for example, Trinidad do a delicious little cigar called the Reyes. Mm -hmm. Tiny. Size of my, you know, little finger. My father loves that. It's a morning cigar. It was selling for 18 pounds. Uh, and then the next day it was selling for 32 pounds. But th that 32 pounds now compares to a beautiful Davidoff in a very significant size. It compares to a Fuente in a good size. It compares to any number of other Cuban cigars outside of those premium brands in a very good size. You know, we're talking Robusto going on to number twos or even Churchill sizes. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, it's going to be very difficult to understand which consumer is so devoted to the Trinidad Reyes that they're going to purchase that cigar in preference to a Romeo and Julieta Y Churchill or a Davidoff Special R, yeah. or any number of other exceedingly good cigars. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I understand <clears throat> the premium of a Cuban cigar over, say, perhaps a New World cigar, because there is a prestige and a heritage 
uh, and they are just at the preeminent uh, of the craft. I mean, a Cuban cigar is a Cuban cigar, and it, in my book, you know, will always uh, occupy a special place. And so I can certainly understand that, you know. And I think, you know, in a large way, I mean, the New World stuff in the United States is not all that inexpensive. I mean, not pushing Cohiba prices, yes. right? Uh, but I think in a lot of ways, many of the uh, Cuban cigars that you guys have in the humidor, compared to the equivalent price you'd be paying in the United States, are a relative bargain. Well, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to hear that, Kirby. Um, it, 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 it's a watching brief right now. I think the, the, the Cubans, as, as much as everyone else in the industry, is, is very interested to see how this plays out, um, whether it presents opportunities for, for non-Cuban brands, uh, whether they will react by increasing prices, mm -hmm. uh, or whether things will change in between. Uh, we don't know yet. Mm -hmm. uh, all I can say is when I put my cigar lover hat on as a consumer, I'm upset. Oh, of course. Uh, as a businessman, I'm intrigued. <laughs> Uh, and putting myself in the shoes of the other main players in the business, i.e. the producers in Cuba, uh, they deserve so much more than they get for this extraordinary product. You know, it's criminal how little money flows back to the magicians in the factories. Uh, oh, the industry me. deserves it at every level. So I got, I got greedy with my ash. I was trying to take it too far. <laughs> Ne ne never worry about that in our it's shop. Marble it's floor. very good. <laughs> uh, well, it's very good for your suit because it will keep the moth away to yes. start with, <laughs> and it's very good for the floor as well because it will enhance the patina. Uh, its shine tomorrow yes. morning. So. The patina. <laughs> I've personally always found the Cohibas too expensive, and I guess now, for someone of my meager means, uh, they will be uh, uh, exceptionally too expensive for me. But I think it also highlights that there's so many other great cigars within the Havanos portfolio yes, that oh, remain accessible. Yes. And also in the new yeah. world as well. I mean, yeah. there's so many beautiful cigars being produced these days that one is lost for choice in many times. Well, Davidoff, what you're smoking right now. Well, exactly. This is the... What are you what? smoking? We spoke about it earlier. <laughs> I don't think they've, they've yet... Uh, had the privilege of you well, telling and them. And give the full description of so exactly what this is. So it's quite a mouthful. It's the Gran Toro 2022 Limited Edition from the Discovery range. And for Davidoff, that encompasses the Nicaragua, the Yamasa, <coughs> and the Escurio line. Three different sources of tobacco. Three different here. tobaccos. Um, and they've incorporated the best of each one into that single cigar. Huh. They've had to broaden it a little bit to accommodate. So it's a 58 <laughs> ring gauge. Unusual for my father. He doesn't often smoke a 58 ring gauge. Um, I'll get a pain in my jaws, but that's well. for later. It's worth <laughs> the pleasure. <laughs> but they've done a wonderful job. I mean, they've really... Uh, I, I'm, I'm very fond of the Nicaragua. I find the Yamasa a little bit punchy for my everyday smoking. And same goes for the Escurio. Mm -hmm. But I find this very approachable and equally delicious as the Nicaragua. So for me, it ticks all the boxes. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, Davidoff, I mean, are master blenders. Well, they are, yes. And it seems quite, an, uh, it seems as you describe it, quite an adventurous blend. Yes, yeah, exactly that. Um, and we're seeing that in general. We're seeing so many new, young, uh, or not even young, first-time cigar smokers. You know, I've, I've met people in their 40s who've never enjoyed a cigar, but COVID and lockdown presented an opportunity for them to sort of tick things they hadn't done before. And one of them was to enjoy a cigar and learn how to do it. Many of them, Kirby, come and say that they met us online on your channel. <laughs> oh boy, well, that uh, brings me great joy. Well, and us too. <laughs> uh, and and they're, they're learning cigars, but they, they don't have a, uh, a, a palate that's been, let's say, prejudiced yet by mm -hmm. one particular tobacco. It's open to all. And I find that they are really curious. They want to try everything. Thank you, Edward. It's a pleasure. Uh, uh, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, so someone that comes in the shop for the first time, mm -hmm. I mean, there's no better place in London to walk into for the uh, uninitiated cigar smoker than into the hospitality of Davidoff of London and the expertise, of course. Where, where would you take someone? Mm. I mean, of course. On that a, journey. A function yes. of of 
if they're coming in for a specific request, then of course you would, you would entertain that. But um, would you take them to Davidoff, something like this initially? Mm, well, it depends. If it's a mature smoker or a beginner, uh, I would ask a few questions before I take them through that. Have you smoked cigars? Is this your first cigar you're going to smoke, sir? Or have you smoked cigars before? Uh, next question will be, when are you going to smoke the cigar? Uh, this cigar, I will not smoke it early in the morning. It's definitely after I had a meal, in the evening. In Once you company. no longer have to work. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, I would ask a few questions before I take them through. I usually start, uh, it's a no-brainer. With the David of number two, you can't go wrong. It's, yeah. it's a lovely, the size of the cigar, the ring gauge of the cigar, the blend of the cigar. It's, it's a cigar I will smoke, and I have smoked many times in the morning after breakfast with the espresso, during lunch, well, not during lunch, but immediately after lunch, in the afternoon and in the evening. It's a cigar you cannot go wrong. Mm. However, if it's a person who is already introduced uh, into the world of enjoyment of smoking the cigar, then I would take them through one or two other ones before I come to something like this. Yeah. The, this is not for the, the young novice. Not novice, for the novice. Uh, it's quite a dark smoker. wrapper. It is, but funny enough, when I started uh, smoking this, it was slightly on the stronger side. Then it mellows down. And as I'm smoking more and more, this is the second one I've smoked. We only received it a few days ago. It's turning into a delicious cigar. It's a meal on its own. You know, it's just fantastic. I don't say that for many cigars. Yeah. It's really beautiful. My only concern is we couldn't get enough of it. But that's another story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It seems to be everything these days. Anything that's good, you cannot get enough yeah, of it. That's right. It, yeah. it, it reminds me of some very wise words, if I may, from uh, Dr. Schneider. Uh, you, we've spoken about him before. He was the, the gentleman who took Davidoff as a brand from a single shop to the wonderful international organization it is now. Um, he was um, a real mentor for my father, a business partner as well in many ways. And um, he wrote some very wise words on a box of cigars he gifted my okay. father. Um, I happen to have that box. Oh, really? May, I, may you indulge me? May, oh, I, may I whip that out? Well, sure. uh, or better still, Dad, may you? Let's make some room. This one can fit on your lap, if you like, uh, or Dad's lap. This box was, he presented this box to me on one of the occasion of one of his visits to London, which coincided with our 17th birthday of the shop. Really? Okay. He's actually dated it here. It was 29th of May, 1997. And he said, Edward, I have a present for you. you just came out with these cigars, the double R. And when I took the box and said, Dr. Schneider, I will not accept it from you unless you sign it and write something for me. And that's what he's written. Come on, Eddie. So <laughs> he's written, eat less, but the best, drink less, but the best, smoke less, but Davidoff. <laughs> I mean, the consummate <laughs> marketing genius, but also from his heart. He really practiced that. He believed that and he practiced that. Um, Dad, would you mind opening the, the box to show Kirby? Because I know you've seen this on one of our videos. Virtually. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> we vir you've seen it virtually. Now we'd like to show it to you <coughs> in reality. In a beautiful cabinet of 50. It's a beautiful yes. cabinet of 50, as we were talking about it earlier. And rare these days. You know, they, I don't believe Davidoff do many of these anymore, if at all. Uh, uh, they, they I can't recall seeing one. Yeah. And it's a, oh, you haven't, you haven't smoked from it yet. Wow. I have not. Such discipline. It. This went straight into my museum because he had signed it as well. Wow, look at those beauties. Oh my goodness. Wow. May I smell them? Please, Please. I insist you smell them. You mm -hmm. can stroke them. <laughs> I wish I could say you could smoke them as well, but perhaps no. one day we will. <laughs> look at those, look at the beautiful. 
kind of ivory band. Okay. It's beautiful. I, I hope one day we'll enjoy this together because mm. none of us expected the Dominicans to, to age that, this the way they have. This box is 25 years old in this shop. Really? Add another couple before, I suppose. Wow. It's practically my age. It is, <laughs> yes, <laughs> times two. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're a joy to behold and wow and i hope one day to smoke because let's not forget these are all lovely to keep and they're all mementos and they mean so much and these were cuban or, or no dominican no, no, no. dominican, dominican okay. one of the first of the not one of the first of the dominicans but it was the first of the double r series a gorgeous cigar another churchill yes am i right mm -mm. no no this is a double corona. it's a double corona oh, okay. it's cousin so a cousin, it's a 49, at least in the Cuban uh, sizing, it's a 49 by, I think, seven and a half. Seven and a half inches, 49. Uh, and, the, and the Churchill would be? Seven by 47. Seven by 47. Very slightly shorter, very slightly thinner. And this is? A 49 by seven and a half. Okay. It tells you how to keep it and what to do with it. Did you follow the instructions? No. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you, Dad. We're, we're on a roll here. Yeah. Nobody thought I would keep this for 20 years, oh, 25 years. Uh, what just, what a memory. I mean, this is one of the things we were talking about this with, uh, with Gemma uh, today, is how, you know, aging a box only increases its meaning, sentimental meaning, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and just the memories associated with that. And she was describing how her father would keep boxes mm. in Cuba and uh, they would hold them for him. And that he would write on the box the date, you know, and with whom he smoked. And of course, many of them were smoked in your great I've company. seen those boxes. Yeah. I've seen those boxes with Gemma in Cuba in the shop called Fifth Avenue. Uh. The only problem is unfortunately they had over humidified the boxes. And some of them were ruined because it was just too much humidity. Well, you know, that, uh, I mean, in Texas, there's times when it gets very humid and uh, there's times when it's very dry, I presume, right? I'm having this trouble with my humidor right now. I was <clears throat> checking in on my sensor push and I think the humidity was, you know, surpassing 80%. Mm. And that's with no humidification, you know, through the traditional fan mm -hmm. and just Boveda packs. No, you need to put the dehumidifier also. You have, yeah. They sell these small units. But it's like, you know, it's like, you know, yin, yes. yang, yin, oh, yang. Yes. Well, in Cuba, I've seen it uh, on several occasions, especially if you visit Cuba in the summer month, July, August. If you go to the shops, you will see, uh, like we have portable heaters or portable humidifying units. They have portable dehumidifying. De and I've seen this unit in the cigar room and they're not using the c container because there's too much humidity coming out. So they've got a pipe, a hose, right out into the street and it's just sucking out the humidity. But even that is not sufficient. Mm. It's yeah. too much humidity. It's I'm like I'm Miami as well. Same yeah. situation in Miami. I'm working on building a walk-in humidor. At least I'm trying to put it together with the idea being that with a larger environment, I'll be able to more easily and consistently control the humidity and the temperature. It could be mis misinformed, so you let me know. <laughs> Try to keep it anything between 60, 65, 68%. And if at times it does go up slightly higher or lower, don't be obsessed with it. End of the day, the humidity, the way you keep your cigars, uh, it's important, but it's not vital. I mean, yeah. this is not a scientific instrument. It's an instrument of pleasure. It's a handmade product. If it's slightly more humid or a bit too dry, just go through it, enjoy it. Don't worry about it. Yeah. That's wow. my opinion yeah. Good and advice. my advice. <laughs> I still think I'm going to text the office whenever we're done <laughs> to open the door to my humidor and, you know, let some of that escape. <laughs> yeah. Tell them to stop taking showers in the yeah, house. Yes. No more showers. <laughs> well, this is in my office. <laughs> and I keep a separate little sensor push outside of the humidor mm -hmm. just to be able to 
you know, monitor the ambient humidity of the office. But the challenge is, is that if you push the temperature down, the relative humidity shoots up. Where, and it's a constant. Uh, the ventilation is very important, though. It is very important to have proper fresh air ventilation. That will keep away the the sogginess, the smell, of this musty smell that sometimes you get in humidors or walk in humidors. If the door is closed, nobody goes in there and there's no air ventilation. Mm -hmm. Not only circulation, but ventilation, pumping in fresh air and sucking out the stale. How know. do you do that in a small humidor? Or you just open it? Yes. Uh, you, yes. And if you're traveling, you will ask your wife very nicely <laughs> to so make be, sure she opens you'll it. You'll be literally. traveling with your wife, surely. <laughs> well, ask somebody. Chores for the children. For the children, somebody, you know, the dog, you know, <laughs> just push it open for a few seconds, literally, to get it some fresh air and close it. Close again. it. Mm -hmm. Well, what do we have here? What's this? It's beautifully lacquered. It's cool. Well, I you know put it this box be here because I knew we talked about. The other yeah. box, which you had seen it virtually, but not in reality. I remember this one you had not seen in its My film flesh crew as has well. all the fun. <laughs> so, Eddie, I'll leave this to you, too. Ooh, well, how can you leave it to me? I wasn't even there. No, that's why you could talk about it well, I will, without I will, getting I will, emotional about it. I will begin perhaps a little bit. Kirby, may I trouble you just to rest the glass? Thank you. Thank you very much. So, this has an interesting story. This Cohiba cabinet, it's rather large, as you can see. And there's a date. And the date is actually very dis indistinct now underneath. But that's fine because you we have a much more... look at the date more, inside, even better. Yeah, well, the Cuba tobacco gives us a clue. But what's inside is what really matters. Um, in 1994... Mr. Shankin, Marvin Shankin from Cigar Aficionado, organized a dinner of the century in Paris. And at that dinner, I believe it was, well, here we have it. Dinner of the century, Saturday, October 22nd, 1994, restaurant Laurent in Paris. And this is a list of the charity auction lots that would be auctioned for the benefit of Cuba's Medical Relief Fund. Mm. The auctioneer was Marvin Shankin himself. Uh, the dinner was exquisite, of course. My father was very lucky to have been invited to the dinner. And there was a series of lots. As you can see, I think we get down to lot A. <laughs> the King's Ransom. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I wish I'd got that one. The but. ultimate <laughs> dream for cigar collectors. 100 Trinidads, 100 Cohiba Pyramids, and 100 Cohiba Grand Coronas, and, and packed in chests of 50 each one bearing the signature of President Castro. And that sold for $200,000 then, in 1994. $220,000. Now... Buyer's premium. <laughs> what I can tell you is that this is a 50 cabinet of Cohiba Gran Corona. And a Gran Corona is the Monte Cristo A size, mm -hmm. as big as they make in standard production, which is a nine inch by, I forget the ring gauge, but big. And um, I think it's 47 or it could, should say could be. in the certificate. Yes, possibly. it could be. And um, dad was able to win this lot and it's number one. So this box of 50 Cohiba cigars have been specially commissioned for the participants of the dinner, the dinner of the century organized by Cigar Aficionado magazine. Out of the 10 boxes made, this is number one. Voila. There's the signature of Fidel Castro here with the date as well of the dinner. And then, of course, that doesn't mean much without seeing the cigars themselves, which are, as far as I'm aware, never ever been produced again. And why, there's a, why is there only 48 of them? <laughs> <laughs> no, there's 50, but the 10 boxes that were made, we, we were given one of each of those cigars. No, no, Kirby the means there's, there's two missing here. No, there isn't. <laughs> 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 Did you see that? It's like when people take the cigar from Winston Churchill, same look on his face. So there you have it, Kirby. You are one of the, the few people in the world wow. to have seen, touched, handled, and otherwise enjoyed this cigar. Here, hold that. Be careful. <laughs> you do not see this very often. Well, this is gigantic. 
So this is a this is the size of a Monte Cristo A. It's a Monte Cristo A size. This is unbelievable. I, I think I smoked the A size that night because I said now I've got the box. I could say I actually <laughs> smoked it as well. And is that the only one you've you've smoked? Did they ever yes. make these in standard production? No, no, never. It's never been produced again. So it's totally unique. Yes. This box and what was smoked at that dinner. Yeah. Well, th th this box and the other nine boxes. Because the other nine boxes, most of it was consumed was, that evening. Ah, okay. Yes. There may have been one more within the lot of the King's no, Ransom. No, there was. There was uh, one or two more there. But most of it was consumed on the night. That, that's a good evening. This is actually like the that. menu I had there in front of me and all the prices they went for. And Looking uh, back, I, I wish I bought all of it. Well, <laughs> well done for even buying this, Dad. I, I, because at the time it was a, a hell of a lot of money yeah. for a thing that was. I think my father did it because it was a good cause. I mean, mm. truly, it was not because he, you know my father. He's not a wouldn't a, surprise me. A, a I have buyer to, be, to sell. I have to be honest with you because uh, Gemma's father, uh, Nick Freeman, we were talking uh, in the earlier. Uh, days of that and one time he mentioned he said Edward the, there's a company in Washington Franklin something I mean you write to them say you want a letter signed by George Washington or uh, you write to them you want a letter signed by Kennedy whatever and they will find it and at the price you could get it mm -hmm. he said the only document that is signed uh, by a prominent person with Fidel Castro's signature, it's almost impossible to find. Very rare, very scarce. And if you ever come across that, get it. And that's, that in mind, I bought this box. Was he at the dinner with you? No, he didn't come to that dinner. I don't know why. Uh, How many people were there? If I'm not mistaken, it was 100 or 120. Mm. Mm. Yeah. That was the limit of the restaurant. And what did I mean? Was it a, by special invitation only, or y yes, uh, you were invited to obviously purchase the ticket. I even forgot how much the tickets were, but it, it was it, it was a lovely evening. We Who won the king's ransom? Do you remember? Hi, I'm Kirby Allison, and thank you for watching today's video. If you enjoy the content that we film here on this YouTube channel, one of the best ways that you can support our ability to film even more great content is by visiting KirbyAllison.com, where you'll find the largest collection of luxury garment care, luxury shoe care, and other great clothing accessories for the well-dressed. Also, we have a Patreon page where 100% of the proceeds from our Patreon go to our ability to travel in pursuit of this quality craftsmanship and tradition. So if you love the content, these are two great ways to support what you see here on youtube.com slash Kirby Allison. I do. I Can do. it be said? It, it, yes, it was jointly uh, won by uh, Lawrence... Uh, Lawrence Stroll? Lawrence Stroll and David Tang. Uh, um, of course. They started bidding separately at the beginning and then at the end they bid together. And Rush Limbo wanted that as well and Desmond Souter, he was there. He was bidding on his behalf, but and then at one point he had let well, go. I mean, it was $200,000 in 220000 220000 yes. I mean, in those in, in today's money, that must be a million. I don't know. I don't Maybe know. Maybe two is. million. Yeah. Or one Nine, bitcoin, uh, right? Ninety-five. <laughs> We're talking about nearly thirty years ago. Does anybody know where the king's ransom is today? Because David Tang sadly has passed I, away. I wouldn't be surprised if eventually, somehow, if not all of it, at least half of it ended up in Hong Kong. Because Sir David Tang was. He passed away. Based in Hong Kong, though. Yes, yeah, so mm -hmm. he passed away a few years ago. Lovely man. These cufflings I'm wearing, it was a gift from him. <laughs> what a great gift. He was a lovely man, David Tang. We still have his walking stick here. Well, he was a huge fan of Cuban cigars. Was well, he, he was. The, well, he, was he the, 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 the uh, Pacific cigars. He started okay. that. Oh, yes. Uh, I thought he was involved in restaurants as well, though. Yes, he had... Uh, Sorry, Dad. 
China David, Tang. Quick. Uh, China Tang. Back, the, back to the safe. In, in the <clears throat> Dorchester Hotel. I don't even feel comfortable with that box that close to the window. <laughs> <laughs> well, I only moved it for, for one reason only. It will be locked up in the safe tonight. Yes, it's off, off, not. off <laughs> Please, Shall Shall I, may I? Or? Well, excuse me, I'm going to ah. show my backside. But it's for a good cause. Because, of course, my, my father being my father, once he heard about the rarity of Fidel Castro's signature and being egged on by his incredulous son in 1997, February 97, at the Cuba 30th anniversary celebration. Thank that you. was the first trip much. Eddie and myself we did to Cuba uh, together. He was a bit younger then. Yes. Bit How old were you? I was 25. So, a young boy. I was a young boy and mm. I was in, uh, I mean, I appreciated what I was experiencing, but if I was in, if, if I had my wisdom now and was in my shoes again back then, I would have done even more. Oh, yes. It was a remarkable You would have spent trip. more time in the factories and less time in the discotheques. <laughs> well, this, this was before you were involved in the business, wasn't it? No, I was, I was in the business okay. at this just point. Then. Just, I just come back into the business um, very recently. And uh, I'm sure I've told you the story. It was partial punishment, partial wisdom from my father's side, as I was not studying as I should do. So he brought me back and, and working in the shop was a very good discipline for me. I thought you were it recording. was meant to be a punishment, of course, but it turned out to be a pleasure, I think. Yes, if I may exactly so. right. Uh, like, like all good things. Um, anyhow, there we were. This was the 30th anniversary celebrations of Cohiba and there'd been a, a lovely week of visiting plantations and factories. And that time, I think it was a really rarefied honor to be welcomed into, into Cuba and to be fated and regaled the way we were. I was in wonderful company. You know, many people, uh, legends of the industry were there. Uh, Desmond Souter, of course, my father, you know, Gemma's, Gemma's father. dad was there. Um, yeah. Simon was there. You know, so many chasing. people, yes, oh yes. Um, it was remarkable. And to cap it all off, uh, the, the evening when this, uh, very special event took place. At that time, it wasn't called the Gala, but it was um, as close to. It was in the Club Tropicana. And um, we arrived there, and there was rumors swirling that Fidel himself would be there. And uh, we were unsure. They said he's going to be there, then he's not going to be there, then he's going to be there, then he's not going to be there. And they told us like, you cannot take your cameras inside, so you have to leave it in the bus. And then as we were leaving the bus, they said, no, you can take your camera, he's not coming. So that was mm -hmm. good. And there we were. And we had a lovely dinner, beautiful music. And then suddenly these military police start to filter into the, into the crowd. And next thing we know, Fidel Castro de deadly himself. Deadly silence, suddenly. I in a know. huge room. Oh, yes. Huge. I mean, it was outdoors, but it was big. near. Yes. I remember nearly 2,000. Maybe I'm wrong, but. Uh, I so think it was a few it, hundred, maybe. No, but no, you no, could no, be right, no, maybe. No, no, no. It was over a thousand for maybe, sure. Maybe, yeah. yeah. And it, open air, where the moon was shining, with the palm trees all around. But and then the sudden silence, not a word. And you could see him walking down the stairs. In military yeah. fatigues, of course. And um, he got up and he addressed the room. And uh, it was in Spanish and being translated, you know, as he was speaking, but also being corrected. <laughs> he clearly knew what he was saying and what was being said in English, but he chose to spoke in, speak in Spanish. And he entertained the room like a consummate MC. You know, the, imagine just the confidence he had. His ability to, to speak, his, his oration, um, his choice of stories and elegance. You know, he, he, he really could have delivered some barbs and jibes and, uh, and, and said a few things that probably should have been said, but he didn't. He held back and he entertained the room and he was incredibly humble and grateful that all these people had gathered 
to help really the Cuban because all the money collected from the from auctions, all over the world, from Europe, from the, the Far East, and from the U.S. as well. Oh, yes. And at that time, of course, the cigar, Cuban cigar in particular, had become an incredibly high-profile um, celebratory ritual in the U.S. Cigar aficionado had driven a lot of that initial popularity. So there we were, and of course there was an auction. And who else but Simon? Simon Chase, uh, the famous Simon Chase. Was that his first yes. time? I think that was his first. Uh, no, I, that was the first time that I remember seeing yes. them on stage there. Mm -hmm. And he conducted the auction. And one of the auction lots happens to be this humidor, which was produced to celebrate the 30th anniversary. Of which you were celebrating. Which we were celebrating. The true 30th anniversary was in 1996, but because it was after the February date of festivals. February 97 was the next occasion where they could celebrate it. And, um, and they start the bidding. And suddenly I see Simon looking over at my father going, <laughs> duh, duh. and then I'm like, oh. And I clocked that my father had started bidding on this lot. And of course, like all immature 25 year olds who don't realize where money comes from, I thought, wow, how fun, you know, that's <laughs> bidding. <laughs> but then even I, at some point thought, oh my God, dad, you sure you wanna do that? <laughs> Anyhow, he was far wiser than I will ever be. And he did bid and he did win. And what seemed like a lot of money at the time um, allowed him to obtain and win this wonderful piece. It's number 30 of 30, again, signed by Fidel Castro and dated. And this particular one is, well, Dad, may I trouble you to yes. reveal? Well, Excuse me, I don't want to block this is, your view. This is Kirby. humidor number 30, a limited and a unique production of 45 boxes, specially manufactured to commemorate the 30th anniversary of the Cohiba brand. It contains 50 Robusto Special Vitiolas, manufactured exclusively for this commemoration by the El Laguito Cigar Factory. The case is of solid cedar, that's the box, the lid of which bears the logo of the celebration, the 30th anniversary, a piece of inlaid artwork of craftsmanship wow. made in the finest wood. And of course, to top it all, it bears the signature of Fidel Castro again, marked 28th of February, 97. Wow. It was a beautiful piece. And if I may... It still is a beautiful piece. Even more beautiful with age. Oh. Again, those cigars, as far as I know, have not wow. been produced again. Um, except for this particular series of humidors made for this event. Classic pigtail, it'll be a 50 ring gauge, and it's called a Robusto Especial because it's a 50, but it's longer than a traditional Robusto. It looks like a seven incher. I could be mistaken, it could be a bit more, um, but it's a glorious cigar yeah. for a glorious occasion. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, what, what an honor to even... Would you like a light? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is unbelievable. I'll hand this back to you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and on the I'm e nervous even holding it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be, please. <laughs> on the evening, I went on the stage and Simon presented the box to me. And whilst... It's all going on. I said, Simon, can I take this bag with me to London? Said, I'm sure you can. <laughs> and I put it under my arm, walked down the stage, went to the table, sat down, and my very dear friend Desmond Souter with his wife Pamela, they were sitting there. I said, I've, I've got this box. I don't know how I'm going to take it. It's not <laughs> going to fit in my suitcase. And Pamela turned and said, Edward, don't you worry. I have a handbag, which I brought some chocolates and things like that uh, for here. You could have that bag, you could put it into that. And it fitted perfectly in my hand all the way from Cuba. We flew with that and we went from Havana to Madrid, from Madrid to London, all in my hand. 
Travel and at that time, key. would it have been risky to import that in? I mean, no, no, there was no risk. As a matter of fact, when we arrived here, I went to customs and I said, I have a box of cigars. There's 50 cigars there. So it's all right, sir. Go along. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. There you go. Imported legitimately. Oh, absolutely. And legally there. Yes. I didn't mention about the signature, though. <laughs> <laughs> Details I didn't ask. That is absolutely beautiful. So of all, I mean, of all of your humidors, right, I mean, is there one that to you is most special or occupies, I don't know, uh, it's... There is, there is. I mean, these are very dear to me, but I do have a... I can't imagine a, anything. A, a modest... <coughs> I was a expecting modest, you to name no, one of these. I have a modest and a humble box of 25 cigars. It happens to be... Well, it's not a full box of 25. It's a half box of Davidoff Dom Perignon. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was presented to me by Zeno Davidoff on the day of the opening of the shop. On 29th of May, when he arrived from the airport, he came and walked in through the shop. I had a lovely ribbon there. He cut the ribbon, came in, and we had a glass of champagne. And he said, oh, Edward, I have a present for you. It's a box of... David of Dom Perignon cigars. And I took it and I said, as always, like same with Dr. Schneider, I said, he says, you know, you have to sign it for me, please. So he wrote on a dear Edward smoke, but don't smoke too much, Zeno Davidoff and the date. And that's the box. I think I've told you the story. I'll say it again though. I promised him, I said, I will not smoke too much. I will smoke one every year. And when I smoke the last one, that's when I will retire. And I religiously did that every year on the anniversary of the shop. Any day of the week it was, on that particular date, I would take once Davidoff Dom Perignon out of that box, light it up, smoke it. And this went on until the first layer finished. <coughs> 13 years passed. Came the 14th year, second layer. I took one out. And I'm looking at it. Well, now the box is not half full, it's half empty. The following year, <clears throat> with hesitation, I took the, another cigar out of the box. <clears throat> and I said, I can't do this. Uh, I'm too young challenge. to retire. I'm talking to myself, Edward, you're too young to retire in 10 years time. <laughs> so I started skipping years and I skipped years. And I think I still have, I forgot how many I have in that box, probably six, seven, eight left in the box. Did you smoke one on the 40th? Uh, I think I did. Did I, Eddie? We might have shared one, if I'm not mistaken. I can't remember. And I should remember. Yeah. Well, well, we could put that right. We'll celebrate that on the 50th. I promise you, I will present you with one, and I'll have the second uh, one. I'll hold you to that. Uh, I, I, I'm sure I'll be around, and I will of do course. it. <laughs> so that box is very special to me. And next to these, because each box has its own wonderful memories. Uh, the, of course, the box that Zeno gave me, the memory is the oldest one, which I will never forget. As I'm telling you the story, it's like it all happened yesterday. Oh, that's but that's amazing. what happens when you get old. <laughs> uh, so the 40th was during lockdown. So w w remind me the anniversary date and this upcoming Anniversary, how many years Eddie, will it be? Your memory is much so fresher 20, than 29, mine. 29, 29th, uh, there's some debate whether it's the 28th or the 29th of May. I think 28th, you, you had the keys, 29th, you officially opened it with Zeno. Yes, the 29th um, was the day of the party as the well. party. So we'll call it the 29th of May. Uh, and this year, it'll be 42. 42. Uh, we're a few weeks early. <laughs> but may, we, may we toast your father. Oh, uh, here, here. Oh, champagne. thank you so much. Yeah, before we... Ah. Thank you. Kirby, I cannot think of anybody uh, better to celebrate our 40 seconds. To Edward Sahakian. <laughs> thank and you. And to the thank legacy you. that you have so thank generously you. shared thank with you, us Dad. all. Dad, you're a good help. <laughs> you're well, wonderful. Well, I've done all I could do up to now. The rest of the work now is on the shoulders of Eddie. Well, it's in good and hands. And I'm sure he will do it justice to that. that, that that's to like you a, as well, Eddie. Thank you, Dad. 40, 42 almost gone and another 142 
on top of it with you and Elvis, I hope. Cheers. We'll very much drink to that. Yeah. Cheers. 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 Cheers.